The next item of business is a Justice Committee debate on remand. Can I invite those members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now? And I call on Margaret Mitchell to open the debate on behalf of the Justice Committee. Ms Mitchell, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm pleased on behalf of the Justice Committee to open this debate on remand and talk to our inquiry report. When a person first appears in court, a decision is taken as to whether they can be released on bail or whether they require to be remanded and held safely and securely until their trial. Whilst remand is therefore a central part of our justice system, concerns about how it is operating have been expressed for many years and remain today. For, it is for this reason the committee made the decision to look at the issue as a priority. We started with a roundtable evidence session in January of this year on the use of remand in Scotland. Over 40 submissions were received and six meetings held in the spring. During this time, the committee heard from a range of witnesses representing all aspects of the justice system and prison service, as well as from those involved in advocacy and support of prisoners and their families. As part of our inquiry, the committee also undertook a visit to Circle Scotland, a charity providing support to families, including those affected by imprisonment, to hear more about their work with remand prisoners and their families. On behalf of the committee, I want to thank all those who took part um, in our evidence second, uh, session and took the time to speak to us and share stories about their experience of being on remand. And last, by no means least, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, my, my thanks goes to the committee clerks and committee members for all their work in compiling this inquiry report. Deputy Presiding Officer, the committee heard and understands that judges do not refuse bail without good reason. Figures on the numbers being held on remand can vary year on year. However, the former Chief Inspector of Prisons said in his final annual report published in September 2018 that he was still concerned about the numbers held on remand. And according to official figures from the Scottish Prison Service, there were 1,361 people on remand in 2017-18 out of a total prison population of 7,644. 7, this compares to around 1,000 people on remand out of a prison population of 6,000 or so back in 1997 Eight, uh, when this parliament was coming into being. And in terms of women prisoners, around 90 prisoners on remand out of 370 um, is the figure now, which compares with 50 out of 200 or so way back in 2000 and, um, 2000 and 2001. And I note in today's Scotsman, the new Chief Inspector of Prisons is quoted as saying that remand should be an absolute last resort. The prison popula population is creeping up due to an increase in remand prisoners and that she has particular concerns about women prisoners held in remand. We therefore believe that to make any difference in the numbers, the reason why judges decide to remand people have to be better understood. Currently, information is not recorded consistently or in a way that allows for more meaningful analysis of the reasons why remand is being used. And it's not possible, for example, to determine if remand numbers are artificially high. This is because they include figures of the, the same individual being remanded several times, as opposed to different individuals being remanded. The committee therefore recommends that the Scottish Government works with the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service to look at options for capturing data in a systematic manner. This could include the use of a pro forma on reasons for granting or refusing bail. We therefore ask the Minister to comment this afternoon on this recommendation and the Scottish Government's willingness to implement it in order to gain a better understanding as to why people are being remanded in custody. The Criminal Procedure Scotland Act 1995 sets out the rules the court must follow when making decisions in bail. These include any substantial risk that the prisoner might not appear in court, might commit a further offence or interfere with witnesses. 
Here, David Strang, the former HMI Chief Inspector of Prisons for Scotland, wrote, in some cases, it appears that remand is used as a heavy-handed way to ensure that the accused attends court for their trial. Clearly, a failure to appear in court often has severe consequences for an individual. However, the committee considers that further steps could be taken to improve the way the courts keep in touch with those required to attend hearings. It notes that text messages are already used to remind witnesses to attend court and considers that a similar system could be piloted for accused, many of whom are categor categorised as having chaotic lives to see if this reduces the use of remand uh, because of a risk of failure to attend. The committee considered this is a, a cost-effective way to address the problem and welcomes this government, the Scottish Government's response that it has sought the views of the Scottish Courts Tribunal Service as to whether this would be possible. And we look forward to the promised updates. In terms of the experience of remand prisoners, Various witnesses told us that many of these individuals can be categorised as having chaotic lives and whilst the average period of remand is just over three weeks, this relatively short remand time can then cause a disproportionately serious long-term disruption to housing, benefits, employment, relationships and health. The committee was also told that this time on remand is largely unproductive with few services available to remand prisoners or opportunities to engage in any rehabilitative services. Members were told there were a number of reasons for this, including the short time they may spend on remand, uncertainty about a release date, coupled with the sheer churn of remand prisoners through the prison system, and finally, that remand prisoners could sometimes be reluctant to engage with services or other opportunities in prison because they considered this may be taken as an admission of guilt. Furthermore, the statutory obligations which require services to be provided to the longer term convicted prisoners can limit the resources available for remand prisoners. The committee recognises the difficulties but considers that more can be done to ensure remand prisoners' needs are assessed and that they are offered the support and opportunity to engage in purposeful activity. The committee has therefore included this issue, issue in its budget scrutiny. During the inquiry, the committee heard concerns about the negative effect of remand on an individual's physical and mental health. We heard about the barriers these prisoners may face merely trying to obtain their medication or continuing with the services which they had accessed in the community. Reasons given for this are that community health records may not follow prisoners into custody. Thus, delays or breaks in treatment can result in, uh, can result. And in addition to this, Medication is routinely removed from prisoners on their entry into prison. The committee asks the Scottish Government and the NHS to respond to these concerns and to put procedures in place to address these problems. The committee also heard that communication between local health boards and the prison service varies and is in effect a postcode lottery. The committee welcomes the indication that steps are being taken to address barriers to information sharing and asks the Scottish Government to provide full details and timescales of the work to be undertaken. Deputy Presiding Officer, in 2008, a report by the Scottish Prisons Commission, chaired by Henry McLeish, stated prison options should include establishing community-based accommodation to tackle the issue of having no abode resu resulting in a refusal of bail. Ten years later, the Justice Committee heard that this issue has not been resolved. For example, 
Professor Hutton undertook a small-scale study of 60 cases within a sheriff court in 2016. He found that in five cases, only a single reason was given for remand. Three of these were no fixed abode. In 2012, the Commission on Women's Offenders, chaired by Damien Ailish Angelini, found that 70% of women who are remanded in custody do not ultimately receive a custodial sentence. The Commission recommended bail supervision be available across the country with mentoring, supported accommodation and access to community justice centres for women. The Scottish Government should further examine the potential of electronic monitoring as a condition of bail and that there should be improved awareness of alternatives to remand among those dealing with alleged offenders. At the time, the Scottish Government's response to the consultation accepted all three of the above recommendations. That was six years ago. The committee hopes that this inquiry will now make these recommendations a reality. So in conclusion, Deputy Presiding Officer, the committee hopes that despite the varied and complex factors affecting the level of remand in Scotland, its inquiry findings and recommendations will not be ignored but will instead help make positive changes and improvements to how remand works in Scotland today. Thank you very much, Ms Mitchell. I call on Ash Denham to open for the Government. Minister. Thank you. To have this opportunity to contribute to today's debate on the issue of remand in Scotland following the Justice Committee's inquiry into the use of remand. And let me first begin by thanking the Justice Committee for its consideration of this matter and the huge amount of work that has gone into it. I'd like to express my thanks to all of those who gave evidence either in person or in writing. And I'd also like to thank the convener for her very thoughtful speech on the matter this afternoon. Remand is a complex issue and I welcome the priority given to issues relating to the use of remand in Scotland through the inquiry. Between 2008-9 and 2017-18, the total remand population fell by 19%, from 1,679 to 1,361. And that is a very important context for the overall debate. And it's unfortunate that a news release issued yesterday by the Labour Party misrepresents some of the data on the remand population. Obviously, there can be wide fluctuations at different times of the year, so highlighting a December figure against an August figure, as happened yesterday, is unfortunately not at all helpful and is actually, in this case, quite misleading. The truth is that the average remand population, which is by far the best way to assess the levels of remand... Excuse me a minute, could I just say to members, if you want to make some points, could you just intervene? It's much handier and it's on the OR. Thank you. The best way to assess levels of remand, the figures that we use, have got shown that they have gone down in each of the last three years from 1,525 in 2015-16 to 1,361 in 2017-18. Despite this, I accept the overall conclusion of the committee that the proportion of remand prisoners compared to the total prison population continues to be high especially in relation to female prisoners. The committee took evidence from a number of key stakeholders to explore the issues in depth and look at how these issues could potentially be resolved. In its report, the committee notes a number of issues which it considers to be key when looking at remand. And this includes the use of remand, the data on the reasons for remand, and the impact that a period of remand can have on an individual. Reducing the use of remand and alternatives to remand and the role of the third sector were also key issues for the committee. And I agree with the committee's conclusion that remand has the same negative impact on people held in custody as short-term prison sentences. And this is consistent with the available evidence. Disruption to employment, housing, family life, continuity of medical care and benefits can have a substantial impact on individuals and also on their families. And I welcome the consideration given to these issues and the recommendations to address the level of remand and ways to better support the numbers of people held on remand. 
Presiding officer, it's important to remind ourselves that decisions on whether to remand a person in custody or to release them on bail are always made by the court based on the full facts and circumstances of a case and within the legal framework that is provided by this parliament. That legal framework creates a presumption in favour of bail in the vast majority of cases. But it does list a number of grounds that may be relevant when the court is deciding whether to refuse bail, such as risks to public safety and also risks of absconding. The report published and the recommendations made, of course, need to be considered and assessed within this context. And I note that there is no suggestion that the legal framework be adjusted in the report. I don't think anyone would disagree that remand will always be necessary for some people accused of an offence. The question is whether there are further steps that can be taken to help those either given bail or who could be given bail if there was additional support for them in the community. The committee made a number of recommendations to address the level of remand, along with suggestions in ways in which the numbers of people held in remand could be better supported. The Scottish Government's response to the committee report was issued on the 23rd of August, and our commitments in programme... I will. David Stewart. I thank the Minister for giving way. Would the Minister share my view that those with mental health conditions are particularly at risk in remand, particularly if their medication is discontinued, albeit for a brief period? Mm -hmm. Minister. Um, those that um, are taken into remand with medications, obviously they're assessed at the time that they're taken in, but I would agree with the member that um, there is potential for some risk to them and they are um, obviously supported in that where, you know, where possible. Um, presiding officer, revised national guidance on bail supervision schemes will be issued to local authorities and we will be exploring with COSLA the possibility of providing funding to radically increase the uptake of supervised bail and support to help ensure that services can be accessed across Scotland. This provision would be in addition to those supervised and supported bail programmes that are already funded through the grant funding formula to local authority, criminal justice, social work services and the targeted funding for women's services. The Scottish Government's response to the report of the committee was developed in dialogue with justice partners, including the Scottish Prison Service and the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service, and sets out action across a number of areas. And of course, we are open to further engagement, and today's debate provides a welcome opportunity to hear views across the chamber, including members of the committee. As we acknowledge in the report, the issues that are faced by those on remand go beyond justice. And the work that we will be carrying out stretches across portfolios, including health, housing and social security. The Scottish Government's justice vision and priorities sets out the Government's intention to adopt a more progressive, evidence-based approach, supported by partners across the justice sector and beyond, to ensure that we live in safe, cohesive and resilient communities. Ensuring appropriate alternatives to custody, in particular around the increased use of diversion and community sentences, is consistent with our understanding of what works to reduce reoffending. We know that short prison sentences do little to rehabilitate people or to reduce the likelihood of their reoffending. Short-term imprisonment disrupts families and communities and adversely affects employment opportunities and stable housing. And these are the very things that evidence shows support desistance from offending. Individuals released from short sentences of 12 months or less are reconvicted at nearly twice as often as those sentenced to a community payback order. In the year ahead, we will extend the presumption against short sentences to 12 months once relevant provisions in the Domestic Abuse Act are implemented. And this will, of course, be subject to scrutiny and approval from the Justice Committee. Reconviction rates in Scotland have fallen to their lowest level in 19 years. However, we still have the second highest imprisonment rate in Western Europe, behind only England and Wales. And so a bold approach is required. The new model for community justice in Scotland has been implemented by community justice partners and we have allocated around 100 million per annum to local authorities to deliver community sentences, support rehabilitation and reduce reoffending. Our commitment to help ensure remand is only used where necessary and appropriate support for our broader approach to the prison population whilst keeping the public safe and reducing reoffending. Data on the use of remand was one of the primary issues raised by the committee. 
And while the issue of whether more data would be helpful has been explored in the committee's report, it's possible that the data on remand that already exists could be more extensively utilised. Analysis of where remand is being used, using administrative data from the SPS, the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service, criminal justice social work and prisoner surveys routinely conducted by the SPS on the remand population already give us an important insight into the characteristics and need of the remand population and issues relating to the use of remand. I don't think I've got time. No, the minister's just coming into her last few minutes, her last minute, I would say, at the very outside. The previous Cabinet Secretary did indicate, when before the committee, that any new burdensome requirements falling on our courts in respect of recording reasons for bail would need to be fully justified when set against the costs of such an approach. And I share that view, especially at a continuing time of scarce resources available within our justice system. And my preference is that the analyst develop the existing sources of information that we have further to help inform our work on remand. And I want to, if I have time, presiding officer, address some issues relating to women. No? Okay. Um, I look forward to the debate. And Minister, perhaps... you'll have time in your summing up. You've had an extra minute and a half. I will. I'll address that in my summing up. Thank you, presiding officer. Thank you. Uh, I call on Liam Kerr to open for the Conservatives. Mr Kerr, please. Thank you, presiding officer. And just for full transparency, I refer the members to my register of interest as a currently practising solicitor. So I'm pleased to have the opportunity to open for the Scottish Conservatives in this debate on the Justice Committee's report and remand and introduce some of the themes that I'm looking forward to hearing about more this afternoon. Credit goes to the clerks for its production, but also to the witnesses for what was a fascinating and highly informative inquiry. The first major learning which I think bears restating is that we should be wary of bracketing those remanded with those convicted. The remand prisoner, at least as far as the report uses the term, has not been found guilty of a crime. Rather, he is accused but kept in custody prior to trial. And he holds that status because a sentencer has decided, based on statutory criteria, that remand rather than bail is appropriate. So I think it is important, particularly where we seek solutions to the fact that around one-fifth of the prison population are on remand, that we do not rush to equate those remanded with short-term prisoners in particular. And it is important that we look at why we remand because of the impact of being remanded. The average time spent on remand is around 25 days. David Strang, the HM Inspector of Prisons, told the committee that it can be disorientating, unsettling and stressful. Those remanded may face barriers to obtaining medication or continuing services they access in the community. Housing or employment may be disrupted. Furthermore, last weekend I visited HMP Grampian with families outside who contributed to this report. They reiterated a crucial point picked up by the committee that the impact on families as well as the remandee is considerable, particularly in relation to Peter Head, which, although there is some very impressive work going on, particularly around visiting arrangements, is still a long, potentially expensive journey for many of the prisoners' families. So, it is vital that the decision to remand is not taken lightly. And this is the key point I wish to make today. The decision to remand is a difficult one. It is a decision made at the start of the process when someone who is accused is brought before a court and the sentencer must decide whether to release the accused on bail. Now, according to the law, bail is to be granted unless the court decides that the public interest warrants remand and there is a substantial risk that granting bail will lead to issues such as non-appearances or obstruction of the course of justice. The court will also have regard to matters including the nature of the offence, the likely punishment if convicted, and so on. So it's not a straightforward process in which a capricious judge takes one look at the accused and decides to remand. On the contrary, as Sheriff Little told us, judges are not eager to remand people. Well, of course they're not. They are more aware than perhaps any of us of the issues and the impact set out in this report. They are the experts who make the decisions daily as part of their job. And their decisions, according to Sheriff Little, are made based on adequate information provided variously by the prosecution, the defence and the criminal justice social work, whose decisions, according to the Edinburgh Bar Association, are well justified and it is difficult to suggest that they are made in error. Yet, according to the statistics, there is no significant difference in numbers being remanded over the last 10 years. They feel uncomfortably high, but we cannot yet say they are inappropriately high. 
We cannot make that legitimate value judgment because there isn't the data to know why bail is being refused, to know which of the criteria have proved definitive in a particular case. Because reasons for refusal of bail are not recorded or collected in a way that allows for meaningful analysis. And without knowing why people are being remanded, it is wrong to conclude, as the then Justice Secretary did, that there is inappropriate use of remand. Maybe there is, but absent the data, we cannot say. And nor, most crucially, yes. Rona McKay. Thank the member for taking an intervention. Uh, I, I agree with your um, a premise about uh, data collection, but um, would the member agree that the fact that 75% uh, of women on remand do not go on to receive a custodial sentence is pretty compelling evidence? Liam Kerr. Uh, I'm not sure what it's compelling evidence of. I think it's highly concerning. I, I definitely agree with you, and I think there is an issue there, but absent the data to understand why those remand decisions are being taken, I think it's very difficult to draw the conclusions and go on to address those factors which have led to remand through measures such as, uh, as the COPS said, bail supervision, electronic monitoring, mentoring, or other alternatives that would uh, deal with that statistic, Rona Mackay. So let's say most people were being remanded because judges were concerned they wouldn't turn up. Then the solution of a text message reminder becomes attractive and appropriate, and a great deal cheaper. Or if this were about restricting movement, David Strang spoke about the possibility of electronic tagging. But more data gathering was not universally welcomed. Judges expressed a view that it, they wouldn't find it very useful when it coming, uh, comes to the question of bail. But surely what it would do is allow perhaps the third sector and social care to design alternatives to remand which address the key concerns of sentencers when refusing bail such that their knowledge of and confidence in using those alternatives is raised. The Justice Secretary also argued that sentencing decisions around bail and remand are individualised, so it would be difficult to create a data collection system that would allow us to deliver greater consistency in decisions. Respectfully, I don't understand this. Surely the whole point is that the system ought to be as bespoke as possible when it comes to decisions on remand, such that consistency, i.e. defaulting to giving both individuals the same outcome of remand, is sacrificed where a sentencer adjudges that one can meaning, meaningfully be diverted to a program that is right for their individual circumstances. It was suggested that additional capturing of data would increase demand on court resources and place extra pressure on clerks. Well, no doubt, but the Law Society tells us that there are significant cost savings to be made by utilisation of alternatives to remand of between two and 13 million pounds over three years. The minister asked for justification for shifting that resource. I think it's right there. So I do not dispute the significant pressures on courts at present and the staff, but if we are realising such savings in the remand system through adequate data capture, surely we can employ those savings elsewhere. So I commend this report to the Chamber, but particularly conclusion 66 on page 18, which states information is not recorded consistently or in a way that allows for any meaningful analysis. And then it says to make any difference in the numbers, the reasons why judges decide to remand people in custody have to be better understood. These are decisions being made by professional, experienced expert sentences, and it must surely not be the role of Parliament ever to fetter the decision-making of the courts. There will always be people who need to be remanded for public safety and other reasons, so let's use appropriate data capture to ensure that those who are remanded need to be remanded, whilst ensuring that those who should not be, who remember have never been convicted of a crime, do not have their liberty curtailed and all the negative consequences that follow simply for want of an alternative. Thank you. Thank you. I, I should say to members and openers that, you know, wait for it. I can be a little light touch about time. Uh, so don't look anxious because I'll let you know if I think you're, you're not getting any more time to it. So that goes for speakers of the open debate tone. And don't interpret that as being over generous. But, you know, I, you will be warned by me, by the pen, if I'm leading you to come to a conclusion. That said, Mr. Johnson, it's your turn now. Please opening for Labour. Duly noted, presiding officer. This is an important debate because it gives us an opportunity to talk about prison. Prison is important, prison is necessary. It provides public protection and it is our harshest punishment for uh, the, the, the most serious of crimes and it is right that we use it. But it's not without consequence and it should be used as a last resort. And many of the issues that concern prison 
are therefore reflecting remand. It's right that we do use remand in order to protect the public. But with both imprisonment in general, but remand in particular, we do have to ask ourselves the question, is its use making the situation better or is it making it worse? And indeed, I think this is a useful debate because it allows us to explore both remand in particular, but some of the broader issues around prison in general, because remand is both part of the issues that the prison system faces, but it also helps us identify many of the wider issues when we are looking at the many uh, aspects to prison. So that's why I thank uh, the committee for bringing forward this debate. I would like to thank the clerks uh, for their diligent work, for enabling us to do this short inquiry earlier on in the year. But I'd also like to thank the prison offices and the, 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 the number of prisons that I visited over the summer, because they do vital work for not very much pay, and they do it with professionalism and with diligence, which I think is truly admirable. But I do think this is an issue which is a test for the government and indeed a test for Parliament because as we have heard from both the convener and indeed from other, other, uh, both the, the, the Minister and from Liam Kerr already, this is not a new issue. And this is an issue that Parliament and politicians keep returning to. When we look at prison and say that we should seek to lower the prison population, remand is one of the, most, uh, one of the first things that keeps coming up, both in terms of its proportion and, and the, the status of those in remand. As I think Liam Kerr was very right to point out, the people who are on remand, in the eyes of the law, in the strictest possible sense, are innocent. Because if we believe in the principle of innocent until proven guilty, we have to remind ourselves of that status. But what is also clear from people like David Strang, the former uh, uh, inspector of prisons and indeed former chief constable of Lothian and Borders Police, and Kirsten Abercrombie of Turning Point, it is being used, and I quote, too frequently. And what the government must grasp is that this is both a complex problem and one that does require investment because prison can cause harm, but there are also savings to be had if this is done properly. But before I continue, I would like to point out that prison involves disruption. We are dealing with people already who live chaotic lives, and that is a, a, an inextricable link and, and uh, relationship. Crime and prison they then can compound those uh, uh, factors. People lose jobs, which means that households lose incomes. Children then use a parent. And I think all too often in recent months and years, we have rightly focused on, on ACEs. But are we compounding those problems in terms of the removal of a breadwinner, the removal of a parent, and the disruption and chaos to a child, which simply reinforces the problem and ensures that it continues in the future? And that's why this debate is important. And I think. Just the, the, the importance of looking at remand is underlined when you look at the numbers. It's 18% of the adult prison population are on remand. Almost a quarter of the female population. Between uh, the, the, the start of the, 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 the millennium and, and 2017, the proportion per head of population in general went from 19 per 100,000 of population were on remand to 25. It is also a significant part of the pressures placed on prisons. 50% of the daily incoming prisoner population and outgoing prisoner population is down to remand. So while it may be around 20% of the prison population as a whole, it's 50% of the prison's work. And I note the minister's remarks about the, the numbers I released. And I always find it interesting when you release an average figure, well, of course, that doesn't reflect uh, the, 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 the accurate figure as it stands today. And if you re release a snapshot figure, well, then it's the average you should be looking at. What is beyond, what is beyond doubt is as of uh, this moment, prison is at a four-year high. Now, if the government takes the right actions and reduces the prisoner population, reduces the, the, the use of remand, I will be the first to congratulate them. But only once that happens. Because the reality is, is, is while that may be a snapshot, since the beginning of this year, people across the sector have been talking to me informally, expressing their concern about what they see as a rise in the use of remand. Now, if it reduces, I'll be the first to welcome it. Now, others have rightly pointed... Of course. Stuart Stevens. Uh, it's just I seek clarification of what I think I heard you say. Uh, that uh, re reception of remand prisoners is 50% of prisons uh, work. It, it, was that intended to mean 50% of reception work? It, it is. Daniel thank Johnson, you. thank you. So for, so for clarity, of, of the number of prisoners on a daily basis coming into prison, 
50% of them will be Remand prisoners, if that. Um, and, and, and again, in terms of numbers, 71% of people on Remand under solemn procedure will go on to receive a custodial sentence. But 43% of, of people on remand for summary. That means a majority of people on remand under summary procedure will not go on to prison. So my question is this, and this is the most fundamental question. If they do not go on to receive a custodial sentence, what are they doing in prison at all? And the cost of this is huge. If it costs over £35,000 per year per prisoner to keep someone in prison, the cost of the total cost of the remand prison population is £15.5 million pounds a year. That is the true cost, and that is why we must find alternatives, because it's the right thing to do, but also because there are savings to be had. Now, others will go uh, mention the gender issues, and I, I know the minister is keen to do that, but you cannot escape the gender issues with regard to the, uh, the, the, the remand population. The numbers are stark. A quarter uh, of, of uh, the, the uh, female Roman population versus 18% of the male population. But what's more, uh, it's considered that 80% of the women in custody are victims of trauma themselves. Now, I hope that's an issue that will be covered off by others in this debate. In closing, presiding officer, this is not beyond our wit to put this right. There are alternatives, established alternatives. Supervised bail accommodation has, is a, a tried method. It's a, a method that works, and it is cheaper. It costs £2,600 a year versus that almost £36,000 a year to have someone under uh, uh, bail supervision rather than on remand. And while I note the minister's remarks about uh, looking at that, the reality is, and we heard it yet again yesterday, in, in the Justice Committee. It is the third sector who are largely responsible for delivering uh, supervised bail and bail accommodation. But both the paucity of that funding and the instability of that funding mean that those services are highly unstable and therefore both those organisations themselves are not able to say with confidence whether they will continue. But also sheriffs and sentencers do not have the confidence that those uh, services that they need as an alternative to remand they are not confident whether they will be there. And as long as that remains the case, that will continue to be a problem and remand will be, continue to be overused. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. Thank you, Mr Johnson. I call Liam MacArthur to open for the Liberal Democrats. Mr MacArthur, please. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. Like other committee colleagues, can I start by um, putting record my thanks to the clerks, to Spice, uh, others who helped in the production of this uh, report, uh, but in particular to the witnesses who gave both written uh, and oral evidence. And as, as others have said, our inquiry grew out, I think, of a general sense and strong evidence uh, that use of remand in Scotland remains more prevalent than I think we would uh, wish it to be, more prevalent than it should be. And while direct comparisons must be made with care, more prevalent than it is in other countries. There's nothing in the Scottish DNA that suggests a higher predisposition to offend or thereafter to abscond, uh, fail to appear uh, in court or commit further offences. And yet, numbers in our prisons remain the highest in Western Europe and the proportion of those on remand similarly at a comparatively high level. Of course, there are circumstances, as I think everybody's acknowledged, in which bail would be inappropriate and remanding an individual is the only safe and responsible course of action. Uh, but for anyone labouring under the misapprehension that a greater propensity to lock people up is a sign of a society taking law and order seriously, let's just look at the facts. It's worth remembering that, uh, uh, that remand is not, as others have observed, a particularly reliable indicator of the likely outcome of any court proceedings. Between 2014 and 17, a little over 40% of those remanded awaiting trial and summary proceedings uh, received a prison sentence. Uh, the Commission on Women Offenders reported in 2012 that a mere 30% of women remanded go on to receive a custodial sentence. Context is imperative, but when imprisonment is deemed necessary uh, for so many before, but not after evidence is heard, alarm bells should be ringing particularly when we know the damaging and counterproductive effect uh, even a short period of incarceration can have. Remand can be the result of an individual's homelessness, but often it's a trigger. As the committee heard, remand prisoners face the same financial and attitudinal barriers as convicted prisoners when trying to access the private rented sector. Those in work face an increased risk of losing their job and finding future work uh, even more difficult. 
Potential disruption to benefits can also be significant. Those released on remand receive no financial support and benefits often take weeks to be reinstated. Meanwhile, the impact on family relationships can be severe and in some cases are irreparable. And the committee heard compelling evidence about how this is a particular concern uh, in the case of women held on remand. And I think Daniel Johnson was absolutely right to point to the gendered uh, nature of this uh, issue. Right also, I think, in pointing to the fact that parental imprisonment is recognised itself as an adverse childhood experience. Trying to mitigate these factors uh, for in the case of those on remand it is not at all easy, as the former Chief Inspector of Prisons, David Strang, pointed out uh, to the committee. Because of the shortness of the time when they are in custody, the regime for people on remand brings reduced opportunities for activity, education and work. And this combination of disruption and long periods of doing nothing is not at all a healthy one. Moreover, given the restrictions around through care, those in remand are also concluded, uh, excluded uh, from what the committee described as quote, the benefits that properly resourced through care support can provide in terms of rehabilitation and reintegration when a person is released from prison. And I welcome the Justice Secretary's earlier uh, uh, offer to me to, to meet to discuss the issue of through care. And I'll look to raise the question of what support should be available to those on remand as well as those uh, serving shorter sentences. Alongside improving the way remand is administered, uh, we have to look more seriously uh, at, uh, at funding the alternatives. The Law Society has estimated that net benefits over a three-year period of between two and 13 million pounds could be realized by the utilization of alternatives to remand. But as the Prison Reform Trust and the Scottish Working Group for, on Women's Offending wrote, the option of bail supervision is not being taken up. In 2015-16, the number was, quote, by far the lowest level in the last seven years. Deputy Presiding Officer, I think the committee was sympathetic to the evidence we heard about why bail is often not granted. And I recognize that the decision to place someone on remand is, 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 is never made uh, lightly. Where compliance seems uncertain and confidence in community-based support services is shaky, sentencers are fails, faced with a real dilemma. Indeed, Tom Halpin at Sacro told us, the courts are supportive as long as the community alternative is credible consistent in there. And again, Daniel Johnson, I think, was right to remind us of the evidence we heard at the Justice Committee earlier on uh, this week about the funding to those uh, critical third sector organisations, both in terms of the squeeze on funding, but also the year-on-year -year uncertainty about that flow of funding which cannot be helpful in providing the reassurance that I think courts quite reasonably are looking for. Surely, the, given the costs of remand on both individuals and societies, we need to be doing more to invest in community-based services. Now, well Welcome what the Minister had to say and we'll look carefully at where that funding is, is, uh, is directed and how it's to be applied. I note from Orkney Community Justice Partnership report in 2017 that figures there appear to be more encouraging. Indeed, the statement was made that particular recognition has been given in Orkney to the value of options of verified information to support bail and provision of short notice temporary accommodation where this could avoid the unnecessary use of custody. And while this may reflect the additional uh, consequences and complications uh, of being held in, on remand for those living in an island community, it does show that collaboration and with the requisite will across relevant agencies, we can deliver results. Ensuring that, uh, that in, in all but the most extreme cases, courts can be assured that a period on bail will be completed successfully. And that, Deputy Presiding Officer, should be the presumption. There's much in our criminal justice system of which we can be rightly proud. However, the number of people we continue to lock up in our prisons is shameful. Given the unnecessarily high financial and human cost of this, we have to find a better, more effective way of responding. And I hope the work carried out by the Justice Committee uh, and uh, taken up in collaboration with the Scottish Government can contribute to delivering that more effective response. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr Kerr. Open debate, slightly generous, six minutes. Take the word slightly as, yes, not overwhelmingly generous. Uh, Shona Robinson, followed by Maurice Corey. Ms Robinson, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. As a new member of the Justice Committee, can I start by thanking those who have helped to produce this report? Scotland's justice system must, of course, be guided by the evidence and be effective at tackling the root causes of crime. We aspire for our justice system to be a world leader in pursuing a progressive evidence-based policy. 
The Scottish Government's presumption against short-term prison sentencing demonstrates the value of listening to the evidence. We understand that the disruption caused by short-term sentencing can worsen the root causes of crime and those in custody for 12 months or less are nearly twice as likely to be reconvicted as those uh, given community sentencing. And as we know that alternatives to custody, such as community sentencing, can be far more effective at rehabilitating offenders. So the Scottish Government has listened to the evidence and has developed policy uh, to match. Yet it has to be acknowledged that the number of prisoners in remand in Scotland is too high. And it's worth remembering that those on remand, as others have said, have not been convicted of a crime they are uh, awaiting trial and the impacts of remand on an individual and their family, as the Minister herself said earlier and as outlined by the Justice Committee report, are comparable to those of a short custodial sentence. Remand can disrupt employment, it can disrupt family life, it can prevent access to medical treatment, it can disrupt access to welfare support and security of housing and being unable to pay bills can put an individual into debt and arrears. For those reasons, uh, we have, of course, adopted a presumption against short sentencing. Yet those on remand who are not convicted of a crime and indeed may never be convicted at all may still have to face these consequences. We have to ensure that we are consistent in our approach to justice. So remand levels in Scotland remain uh, too high and it is right that in Scotland we have a presumption in favour of bail unless of course the court considers remand absolutely uh, necessary. There will be times when that is the only option particularly with consideration to uh, public safety and decisions over whether an indivi individual is eligible for bail is a matter of course for the courts whose independence must be respected yet it's imperative that the use of remand is justified. As a new member of the Justice Committee, I find it extremely worrying that only 30% of women held on remand receive custodial sentences. That means up to 70% of those women were held in custody on charges for which the courts did not hand down a custodial sentence. And we know that remand can have a particularly negative impact on women. The Justice Committee has been, uh, been told that the, the number of visits for women on remand can be significantly less than those for young men. Male partners of women in prison are less likely to visit. Uh, and bear in mind that women in remand make up uh, almost a quarter of the total number of Scotland's women prison population. And of course, that's before we look at the impact on uh, families and children. Clearly, we have to question why the, the numbers are so high and we have to do something about it. And there have been welcome efforts by the Scottish Government uh, in this regard. Since 2015-16, the Scottish Government has invested £1.5 million annually to develop bail sentences and early intervention programmes for women. Bail supervision, bail support and electronic monitoring offer progressive alternatives to demand. For example, by working in partnership with social work in the third sector, bail supervision requires an individual to meet with their bail supervisor a specified number of times each week. An individual's housing or employment opportunity would therefore not be impacted. I'm confident that policies such as these can have long-term positive impacts on reducing our prison population. Yes, of course. Liam Kerr. <coughs> Just very briefly, I thank the member for taking the intervention. I don't necessarily disagree at all with anything she said, other than, uh, do, does the member not agree that it's important that we understand why, despite these efforts, remand remains so high so why are sentences still putting people in, onto remand despite the efforts that the member alludes to? Shona Robertson. Yes, I agree. We have to get to the bottom of that. And uh, I think there's more work to be done in that regard. And um, I'm sure that uh, in response to this debate and the issues being looked at, that um, the Scottish Government will, will do just that. Um, I am also pleased that the Scottish Government that has announced that it will issue revised guidance and additional funding for supervised and supported bail. Uh, the Justice Committee has raised concerns over a lack of consistency on remand sentencing. Revised guidance may allow for a more consistent approach and I look forward to hearing uh, more details of this. Of course, as we recognise the need for a man to be used appropriately, compassion and support for the victims of crime it must always be a guiding principle of our justice system. And I, I want to, to end with that. To, 
develop progressive alternatives to custody is, is not uh, to neglect the needs of victims who must always have our respect and our support. And that's why I also welcome the Scottish Government's commitment to an additional £1.1 million of funding, which will be provided to allow trials involving rape to begin as early as possible, minimising the distress caused to victims. And that will be in addition to the £18 million that the Scottish Government has already provided to support the victims of crime, including support for organisations such as Victim Support Scotland, who do a tremendously important uh, job. We need a progressive approach to justice that ensures that all are treated fairly and equally. There is, of course, more work to be done in this area, as I said earlier. In particular, the number of women in remand is still disproportionately high. Uh, we need to get to the bottom of that, and I'm confident that by developing progressive alternatives to custodial sentences, we can continue to work to ensure remand is used appropriately as part of Scotland's progressive approach to justice. Thank you very much, Mr. Robertson. Call Maurice Corrie to be followed by Fulton McGregor. Mr. Corrie, please. <coughs> thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, I also thank the clerks and the organisations who have provided an input and evidence for this report. Uh, the use of remand must not be ignored, and so I welcome this time today to address it. Uh, as, as stated already, remand figures have been on the rise since 1997. There is also a significant proportion of those who are remanded, but in the end do not receive a custodial sentence. And we must look at this system head on and recognize that reasons for demand should be better understood. I do not doubt that in many cases, remand is necessary to have in place. Individuals are put on remand either before their first appearance in court, their sentencing, or prior to their being granted an appeal. It can sometimes be the best option for some, especially if they have a long history and record of past crime, a history of breached bail, or failed to adhere to court orders. In these cases, it is obvious that it is a safer place to place them in remand for these individuals. But we have to be careful to recognize that problems can stem from remand. Less remand would lessen its negative impact. It has been overused in Scotland, making about a fifth of the prison population and nearly a quarter of the female population in particular. Due to this high level, overcrowding in prison is now a common problem. This means that prison staff are placed under enormous pressure to tackle what can often be difficult situations. We know that bail is not, is not refused without good reason. Judges understand the patterns of crime more than we do. Yet this frequency must be examined in further detail. Why do judges remand such high numbers? Having this answer would allow us to better understand why remand cases have risen. As my colleagues have said already, this could be achieved by collecting more data and knowledge behind the reasons for remand. Having this access would help us to properly evaluate the current system and determine how it can be improved. I welcome the research by, uh, conducted by Professor Neil Hutton on this matter. Uh, his work found that it is uncommon for offenders to be remanded solely because they represent a danger within the community or due to the seriousness of their crime. Instead, his research shows that individuals are placed in remand due to a lack of services or information in their local community to offer support. There are hosts of issues that can arise from a person being placed on remand. Their lives can be uh, unnecessarily disrupted. While on remand, employment prospects are lowered and housing situations become less stable. Relationships and health care can often struggle to continue. And I'm especially concerned about the toll of remand on health, and particularly mental health. The uncertainty of this time in prison can potentially worsen feelings of anxiety and depression in vulnerable individuals. Surely this must make it harder for them to escape the increasing likelihood of reoffense. These mental health issues will be more difficult to tackle without the stronger communication between local authority health boards and the prison service. Uh, this lack of dialogue means that some offenders can slip through the cracks in the remand system and the Scottish Government must not allow this to happen. As the Justice Committee has heard, remand time is largely unproductive with limited opportunities for rehabilitation. This fails to stop the damaging effect on both the individual placed on remand and their families. As a charity of families outside found out, uh, the time on remand is too short to allow proper engagement between the offender and their family to kickstart changes that, can make, that they can make in their behavior. As the Justice Committee found out, Parental imprisonment can have a strong impact on children and can lead to offending behaviour in the future. And I believe it would be more valuable to have a greater focus on rehabilitation activities for those on remand from the start. Constructive programmes encouraging education and work would be far more beneficial and would help their sites focus beyond the prison walls. 
This could be break up the cycle of crime and reoffending as we see in our communities, and it would create avenues for purpose that can redirect the lives of offenders. Currently, remanded prisoners fail to be offered a robust support system upon their release. The, system, the challenges they face outside prisons, such as welfare and housing, have not been handled as seriously as they should have been. Rehabilitation services uh, would encourage this support to be readily available for their release, to decrease the likelihood of reoffence and therefore the burden of remand. And stronger communication is needed between the various bodies within our criminal justice system. This would ensure that information on the best support programs are considered rather than placing offenders on remand and stronger collaboration between housing groups and the prison service would help to meet accommodation needs with great advice on offer. And Deputy Presiding Officer, in conclusion, remand should not be an unproductive one-size-fits-all system. For some, support needs to be more readily available to effectively rehabilitate their lives. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Corey. I call full to McGregor to be followed by Mary Fee. Mr. McGregor, please. Thank you, President Officer, and I welcome this opportunity to speak in this very important debate. When we were doing the inquiry, I was a member of the Justice Committee, and I'm pleased to say that I am again, having um, just been back onto the Justice Committee recently, and I would like to, as others have said, express my thanks to the clerks for the uh, amazing work that they've done. I'll also just quickly um, make a declaration of interest as a social worker um, with the, registered with the SSSC, uh, a previous experience in the justice field. The number of remands are decreasing, although they do remain very high, President Officer, and can I explore the possible reasons for this, the impact for the person remanded, and of course the possible solutions. Evidence from committee has suggested that time spent on remand can result in a significant disruption to an individual's life and their wider family. This can mean in terms of an individual's benefits, their housing, their employment, their education and their medical treatment, as well as having a negative impact on the accused's family and children. Some families may experience considerable stress, especially where procedures are unfamiliar and outcomes unknown with consequential impacts on their physical and mental health. This, for me, was the main focus of the, of the inquiry. The Scottish Government have made considerable progress in terms of implementing the presumption against short-term sentences, but remand periods are, in effect, a short-term sentence. In some ways, they are even worse. David Strang, already quoted from Her Majesty's Chief Inspector of Prisons for Scotland, for example, stated to committee, in general, the regime for people on remand brings reduced opportunities for activity, education and work. And I agree with this. Remand prisoners are restricted in terms of visits, access to the gym, exercise and taking part in educational studies or any meaningful work. Indeed, they spend much of their day in their cell awaiting the forthcoming court appearance. Remember that this is before they have even been convicted of any offence or wrongdoing. We must, however, acknowledge that there is appropriate use of remand, and I know others have said that, and as the then Cabinet Secretary and the Minister today rightly pointed out, it is a matter for the courts. However, it was agreed, and there is a general consensus, that we all must work together to reduce the need for unnecessary use of remand, and with the majority of those remanded spending an average of 26 days in prison, it must be noted that this is a lengthy period. Surely there must be a better way to move forward. Yes, yeah, certainly. Liam Kerr. Just purely on that point, you talked about unnecessary use of remand. Uh, I'd be interested to know how the member can understand if it is unnecessary without knowing why it has been implemented in the first place. Fulton yeah. McGregor. Member for that point, it's something that I'm going to come to in the report, but the member knows as, as well as I do that we took the evidence on a uh, committee together and we know that remand isn't used lightly by, by judges, by sheriffs. However, there is, a, um, there is an element there of, of of remand being used for circumstances that I think we could move away from. But as I say, I'll come back to that. Because there is a major impact on the lives of those who are subject to remand. Remand does not impact positively on rates of recidivism. In fact, it leads to an increased likelihood of offending. Housing benefits, etc., are all affected, as I have said um, earlier. Access to medications and other health initiatives and interventions can be limited or even in some cases cut off for a short period of time. And, as we've already heard, the impact on an individual's mental health can be major. This could be due to a lack of access to treatment, contact with family and the experience of being remanded itself. And reflecting on the evidence Anne Pinkman gave us, it should, remand should never be used as an alternative to a mental health facility. In fact, just this week a constituent um, told me about a situation where a family member's involvement with the criminal justice system and court, and court appearances was in fact the result of mental health issues and has subsequently led to, to treatment. 
I am pleased that as part of the mental health strategy, the Scottish Government have committed to funding 800 additional mental health workers in key settings, including prisons. And, and also other members have spoken about um, the impact on women and young people particularly, and that was highlighted through committee. Um, but we need bespoke solutions for women who offend and for young people who offend. And I'm pleased about recent, fun recent funding and community justice projects in these areas. But some of the most powerful evidence we heard presenting also during the inquiry was on the impact of children and families. Liam Kerr, of course, has mentioned this. The stress and stigma caused to families is one that can be difficult for us to imagine. Families outside described impact on children and the trauma can be caused by the arrest and the subsequent remand of a parent. And of course, we must remember that the opposite can be true. Now, I can go back to, to my time as a social worker in, in children and families, when a period of remand was per perhaps for a domestic abuse offence and removed a perpetrator from that situation. So we must understand that there is also other circumstances where people can be kept safe. Acknowledging that there is appropriate use of remand and what can be, what can be done to reduce it, particularly where the main reasons are around chaotic lives, missed court appearances, etc., perhaps answering Liam Kerr's earlier question to me. So, where there, so what I'm saying is where there's not a concrete danger to threats or threat to others, and that was something that we, we heard through the inquiry. And my, my belief is it's more intense community sentences is the answer. The Scottish Government provides additional funding for bail support services, and specifically for women. I'm supportive of bail supervision services and had a good experience of this resource while working in South Lanarkshire. And unlike remand, bail supervision does not disrupt families and communities and through intense intervention does not adversely impact on employment opportunities and stable housing. Bail supervision through social work or the third sector would other, for somebody who would otherwise be held in remand or, re or released on bail, they meet with a bail supervisor uh, in a specified number of times a week. Usually um, it can be up to every day actually, but usually two, three, four times a week. And just yesterday at committee, we heard from third sector organisations that would often be well placed to carry out this work if local authorities can, such as, for example, SACRO. 1.5 million has been invested annually since 2015-16, specifically for the development of bail supervision services and early intervention schemes. And courts could also consider arrangements for those already on community orders who perhaps pick up another offence, perhaps folk that are already on um, supervision orders. More communication between courts and social work is something that came up. This did happen in my area when I was employed in social work, but we heard through the committee it was Apache across the country, and there's perhaps something we can do there. Presiding officer, I actually have more to say, but um, I can see that I'm running out of time. Um, so I would like just, just to end on that I am pleased that the Scottish Government is committed to ensuring remand is only used when necessary and appropriate. And in the programme for Government 2018, the Scottish Government announced that they will issue revised guidance and provide additional funding for supervised and supported bail to ensure that demand is only used in these circumstances. And I hope that if we were to go back and committee was to do, um, take evidence on such an inquiry in the future, that um, we, we would see that those steps have been taken and that they have worked. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, thank you, Mr McGregor. Can I remind members, I said there was room to be slightly generous with time, so don't fash yourself. If I thought you were taking too much time, I'd have shown you. Uh, take Mary Fee, please, to be followed by Ruth McGuire. Ms Fee, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I want to thank the Justice Committee for the in-depth analysis that they've carried out in their inquiry into the use of remand in Scotland. And during my time on the Justice Committee and through numerous meetings I have had with organisations involved in the criminal justice system, I have heard about the long-standing issues around remand and the impact its overuse has on individuals, on families and on the justice system. And I do welcome the analysis and the findings of the inquiry. And I hope that the Act is a starting point for the Minister and for the Scottish Government to reduce the use of remand and to limit the impact on families, on children and on the health and well-being of those on remand and serving custodial sentences. And, presiding officer, most of my contribution today will focus on the issues faced by women in the justice system. And colleagues will be aware that this is an area that I have given great focus to in my time in, in Parliament. And can I also, at this point, remind colleagues of my involvement with the cross-party group on families affected by imprisonment and also with the newly formed cross-party group on women's justice. 
and in assessing the average daily population by type of custody for the decade between 2007 and 2017. The statistics tell us that women are more likely to be in remand than men, despite there being a decrease in both sets of figures for men and for women. We do need to have a clearer understanding of why there is a gender disparity and a further understanding on the impact that this has on children and on families. And the Commission on Women Offenders, which reported six years ago, um, acknowledged that there has been some progress on the, the recommendations. Um, and it is clear that, that women remain at a, a greater risk of reoffending and falling into destitution as a result of a period of imprisonment. And the complex needs and issues that women offenders experience can exacerbate pre-existing trauma and pre-existing mental health issues. That's why we need alternatives to prison, prison, such as wraparound health and social care programmes, and they are vitally important. It is, however, fundamental to the success of these types of programmes that funding is guaranteed, and not only that, that support is tailored to the need and is in place for as long as people require it. And evidence to the committee has shown that 80% of women in custody have experienced trauma and abuse. And without the appropriate support in and out of prison, then long-term problems associated with remand and reoffending will continue to impact disproportionately on women. This also has an impact on public funding that goes directly to the criminal justice system and to the external organisations that support women. And in the many meetings I have had with third sector organisations, I often hear about the unintended consequences women experience when held on remand. And one of the most distressing concerns is that women receive fewer visits when on remand or sentenced and are more likely to lose contact or be physically distanced, distant from their children. And this is partly due to the provisions of the women's estate. Homelessness is also a major worry, as the committee have recognised in their report. Single women and single mothers often find themselves losing their tenancy when held on remand, even for a short time, or if they are given a custodial sentence. Ensuring that alternatives to remand are available will be beneficial to women and families. But resources must be spent throughout the process to directly support women and to prevent homelessness. And these alternatives to custody should also provide support to the whole family. Children can and are being unfairly punished and often forgotten in this process especially if they are taken into care. And colleagues across the chamber will be aware that I have frequently spoken of children as the forgotten victims of crime, suffering loss and distress with no help and no support. Partnerships between statutory services and the third sector are crucial in keeping families together as a result of parental imprisonment. Evidence to the committee shows that alternatives to remand, such as the Glasgow Women's Supported Bail Service, reduces the damaging impact of imprisonment and increases positive outcomes. Addressing the underlying cause of women's offending is key to that. And third sector groups like the Prison Reform Trust, Families Outside and Turning Point Scotland are vital to identifying and addressing these issues. They can be caused by poverty, by family breakdown, by mental health and by drugs or alcohol abuse. And as a final point, I agree with the committee that supervised and supported bail programmes should receive more funding in the next budget and be made readily available to those that could benefit from them. In closing, presiding officer, I want to stress that prison should be a last resort. If you are found guilty of breaking the law, then you should expect to receive some form of punishment. However, too many people end up in prison, especially through the remand, where more suitable options should be available. 
tackling the underlying causes of crime, substance abuse, poor mental health, poverty, they should be a key driver in the Scottish Government's plans to assess remand and break the cycle of re-offending. Thank you. Ruth Maguire, followed by Oliver Mundell. Presiding officer, short-term imprisonment is often ineffective and reducing the use of ineffective short-term imprisonment and increasing the use of robust bail options is part of a smarter approach to tackle offending and make our communities safer. Evidence indicates by weakening social bonds and decreasing job stability, it's possible that short-term imprisonment can actually increase long-term offending. And it's the importance of those social bonds and the impact on families and children that I'd like to focus my remarks on today. I recently took part in Send Your MSP to Prison, organised by Families Outside. Families Outside is the only national independent charity that works solely on behalf of families affected by imprisonment in Scotland. I'm grateful to them for the opportunity to experience a flavour, and it could only be a flavour, of what families experience and for the work that they do supporting families and professionals. I travelled from my home um, in Irvine to Kilmarnock Prison. That was two buses and about 30 minutes of walking at a cost of eight pounds. Now, for all of us sitting here, that doesn't sound too taxing, but making the journey at various stages, I wasn't too hard to imagine how much harder it would be having children in tow in bad weather how much harder it would be if that eight pounds was making a big dent in your income for the week. How much harder it would be if it was a loved one I was going to visit when I was running um, characteristically late. When someone goes into custody on remand, the issues that families face are very similar to the impact of longer periods of custody once sentenced. Yes. Liam Kerr. Yeah, it's a very good point that's being made about the bus. When I did the Peterhead one, um, the, the, the transport was actually paid for. The Scottish Government, I think, are funding a, a six-month trial to see if it will work, which is excellent. And I just wonder if uh, I can ask the member to ask the minister in closing if that can be extended going forward. Ruth Maguire. I'm sure that the minister heard the member there. Um, <laughs> Even for short periods of custody on remand, families will experience considerable stress, especially where procedures are unfamiliar and outcomes are unknown. The impact on physical and mental health and well-being of those things are, are you know, obvious. It may, be their income, it may put their income and housing at risk, um, especially if that's been previously unstable. And the potential breakdown in trust can, of course, lead to division within families and breakdown of family relationships, something likely to have a longer duration than the period of remand. Explaining custodial remand to children was obviously difficult, and younger children will be unlikely to draw a distinction between imprisonment for sentence and imprisonment for remand. Children who've witnessed an arrest will be particularly traumatised, and the Publicity and stigma surrounding a person's arrest and custodial remand can potentially leave a lasting suspicion from family, friends and neighbours, even if the person is not convicted. For the person in prison, their experience in the first 24 hours of custody can be crucial to how they cope, especially in terms of risks of suicide. Visits of fam from family can help alleviate stress and depression amongst prisoners, but prison visits can be particularly challenging for families during the period of remand. Families outside told me that when someone is in prison on remand, families are allowed to visit daily for half an hour a day. Families will want to make these visits. Of course they'll want to make them. We all would if someone we loved was remanded. And while these daily visits are welcome, many families will simply not be in a position to, challenge, uh, to travel to prison for regular visits due to distance, due to cost, due to time, travel consent constraints. From the neighbouring town, my journey was nearly two hours and eight pounds. And I know from constituency casework of families having to make much longer, more expensive journeys. And I also know the heartache experienced when they're simply unable to make those visits because of distance or finance. 
The Justice Committee took powerful evidence about the impact of placing a person on remand. Concerns included a lack of information about court procedures, loss of trust and breakdown in relationships, impact on physical and mental health, and worries about what to tell children. Families of offenders or alleged offenders are not guilty. Children of offenders or alleged offenders are not guilty. I want to acknowledge the many folk doing good work in this area and in particular mention and give grateful thanks to family outside, families outside, East Ayrshire play motivators, Centre Stage and the prison officers who I saw firsthand doing their very best for families and children visiting Kilmarnock Prison. Parental imprisonment is recognised as an adverse childhood experience and acknowledging um, excuse me, sorry, and that childhood experience can in itself lead to offending behaviour. Presiding officer, I recognise that bail decisions are of course a matter for the courts and in closing say that I welcome the Scottish Government's commitment to reducing the high rate of imprisonment in Scotland, but we must never forget that the families of offenders or alleged offenders are not guilty. We must never forget that the children of offenders or alleged offenders are not guilty. And if we aspire to become a trauma-informed nation that breaks cycles of harmful behaviour, then all of us must do absolutely everything in our power to minimise the disruption and upset in children's lives when a family, when a parent offends. Quite simply because that's the right thing to do. Thank you. Oliver Mundell, followed by Stuart Stevenson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I would like to join members and put my thanks uh, on the record to the whole Justice Committee and the clerks for producing this vital report. There can be no doubt that the number of people on remand appears to be too high, and the reasons for that need to be interrogated further. I think we must make it clear, though, that the safety of our communities should come first in these matters. As the committee have clearly stated, remand should always be used where necessary for public safety. But it can also be a blunt tool. The state ex exercises a great power over the individual when it comes to the removal of their liberty. That power must be matched with the highest possible level of responsibility especially when the person being locked up has not yet been found guilty of a crime, and indeed, as others have pointed out, may never be. And it's not only a removal of liberty, spending a few weeks in jail uh, can mean losing your job, your home, and your family. Chaotic lives are inadvertently made more chaotic by a system, and it is that much harder to rebuild your life when you eventually leave prison. So there has to be very good reason for refusing bail. Sheriffs tell us that it is always there and that they don't make these decisions lightly. It is difficult to disagree. Judges are of course the experts and we should, as a general principle, not interfere with their work. They are rightly independent from politicians and it is for them to decide on individual cases. And that should always remain the case. However, as the committee have so correctly pointed out, there's no way to meaningly, meaningfully analyse the prevailing reasons that judges give for remand. We can only address any problems that may exist once we start to understand systematically uh, what's going on by recording why bail is refused. As my colleague Liam has, Kerr has already made clear, uh, we need to be gathering that data as the first step. Whatever action the government takes has to be led by evidence, and at the moment there is simply not enough evidence to conclude anything. Regardless, alternatives must be readily available when they work. One of the most compelling parts of the Justice Committee's report was the evidence that something as simple as a text message to the accused on the day before trial has the enormous potential to improve attendance rates at court. If those rates can improve, we can get to a position where, uh, we are more, where we're more sure that someone's going to turn up and therefore might not, not need to be in remand in the first place. So text messages have promise. We do it for things like GP appointments, 
and the technology has been around for a while now. It's a common sense approach and I think we should all support it. I'd urge the government to get moving with a pilot in one or more courts as the committee has recommended. Finally, I would like to touch on the lack of opportunity offered inside prison walls. Even if remand is too high, there will always be a need for it to exist. Where there is a clear risk of reoffending or interfering with witnesses, or where the, suspect, the suspected offence is of the most serious nature, remand will always be necessary. However, uh, this, there is a problem, uh, even where people are on remand, uh, where there's a lack of work and education uh, within prison. And this will continue if nothing has, is done. There has been a decline of purposeful activity, activity generally in our prisons recently. There was a drop of nearly 300,000 hours in the last year alone. And it's now at its lowest level since 2011. That to me is not good enough. The number of vocational qualifications completed in Scottish prisons is also plummeting. Again, not good enough. Uh, this is unacceptable and must be reversed. We know that meaningful activity is crucial to rehabilitation and there must be an effort to ensure remand prisoners are using their time to work or learn. This will help not only them, uh, but will help and serve our communities. Presiding officer, remand must always be an option to keep victims and the public safe. But we need more data to find out whether or not it's been used effectively. If anything, uh, this important work that's done by the committee has shown that point and it deserves action and attention from the government. It cannot be beyond uh, the government's power to get on top of this issue and to help members, help the witnesses, help the individuals, families and communities affected by this issue to understand what's happening around remand so that we can make better policy so judges uh, can be clear about the decisions they're making and the effects they have. Thank you. I call Stuart Stevenson to be followed by David Stewart. Um, I uh, previously was the uh, SNP uh, Shadow Deputy Justice Minister between September 2004 and uh, May 2007, and as such uh, was responsible in particular for prisons. Uh, so I'm fortunate to have visited prisons in four countries and found very different patterns uh, to which they work. In my own parliamentary constituency, uh, I, right from the point I was elected, had uh, Peterhead Prison, which was originally opened in 1888, a classic Victorian uh, prison uh, long overdue for replacement. Now we have the modern uh, HMP Grampian serving uh, very different purposes and much more of a local prison for a mixed uh, prison population, including uh, remand uh, prisoners. Um, it, it's worth uh, making the point, I think, that this report, uh, which is wide-ranging in its scope, uh, makes many interesting and useful uh, recommendations, um, is leading to this very useful debate. The thing I want to perhaps uh, start on is the subject of statistics, which I think almost every uh, contributor to the debate uh, has made some comment on. I'll just make a few observations. Um, in the 270 plus uh, committee meetings of justice, which I have uh, attended since being elected, it feels even more presiding officer sometimes. Um, we've made visits to many different places. And one of them I remember in particular was a Monday visit to Glasgow Sheriff Court. I think there were eight courts running in parallel. Uh, the court we were visiting was the, the weekend incarcerations. We had 59 appearances in the hour that we were in that court. And a fair number of them were ending up as remands. And you have to ask yourself the question, how much consideration therefore was given to the remand process when you're spending about a minute per case? And I think that's a good and valid question we should properly ask ourselves. Now, it is also worth making the point that my judgment, and that's all it is, but shared, by, I think, by other members uh, who were present at the time, is there wasn't a newcomer among the 59 people. They all knew the system, so I could see perhaps where the judge was coming from. But I think, let me focus in. 
on that proportion of people who are subsequently convicted, having been remanded, but not imprisoned thereafter. I think that is the part of this issue that might most susceptibly, if studied in depth, give us information. Because I think if we were to look at a case where a judge decided for whatever reason that remand was the proper thing to do, part of that is presumably considering that imprisonment might be the ultimate end. We should look at that and see why there appears to be what seems to me at least a mismatch between the judgment made at remand and the ultimate outcome. And I think that might particularly inform us and perhaps the judicial system about their uh, remand decisions. And I think that's an area where the, the government might consider uh, getting an academic to look at an appropriate number of cases uh, that fit that criteria uh, in, in looking at uh, uh, what's going on. Now, also, um, the, the, the committee at uh, paragraph 154 uh, talks about what informs a remand, and there's a whole series of things, but it does make the comment that decisions are usually made under significant time pressures. Well, I've seen that, and I think that's absolutely uh, spot on. Uh, similarly, it talks about there is some data and some courts of a tick list which at least uh, records. And I think that could, as the committee recommends, be more uh, widely done. Um, in evidence, the Sheriff's Association uh, talks about uh, written reasons for refusal of bail are provided if an appeal is taken, but only then. Um, and most of it's given orally. And having been in court um, and watched uh, witnesses and accused hearing a quite rapid delivery of various oral things related to bail conditions and so on and so forth, it's perfectly clear that the person hearing it isn't absorbing at all. So I think there's actually a real danger of justice not being served by our not writing it down and making sure that the prisoner and the prisoner's uh, lawyer is getting that so that they know exactly uh, what is happening. I want to just, uh, in the short time remaining to me, presiding officer, uh, make a comment or two uh, about health. Um, the, the, the committee at uh, paragraph uh, 84 properly says when you put people on remand into prison and that's their only experience in prison, that nonetheless leaves the mark of prison upon them and carries with it a considerable risk. And at paragraph 98, and here I'm going to pick at the words the committee has used, committee considers procedures should be in place to ensure that where appropriate, prisoners retain access to prescribed meditation. I don't know what the where appropriate means. I would think there should be almost no occasion where prisoners should be denied access to the medication prescribed by a qualified practitioner uh, from, uh, from elsewhere. And there is reference uh, in the government's response uh, to the committee's report to the inter if the presiding officer permits. Yes, I can allow that, Jen Mara. Thank you, uh, presiding officer. Would the member agree with me? I'm, I'm slightly concerned that um, a few years ago the um, government decided that NHS would take over um, health services in prisons. So does he share my concern that things don't seem to have become more seamless from provision outside prison to health provision in prison with that change? Stuart Stevenson. Uh, well, certainly with the NHS uh, supporting people in the community and in the prison, one might imagine uh, that sharing data would be somewhat more easy than other arrangements might place. And I think that's certainly something that we should look at. But then I think there are general issues about data uh, and medical data, which health professionals sometimes get in the way of doing. Uh, briefly, uh, presiding officer, uh, the immediate needs referral, which has been piloted, um, it says, while there's no statutory obligation where local resources permit, establishments may extend this model to include those on remand. I encourage the government to act upon that worthy uh, thought uh, that they've said uh, in, their, in their response. Um, the, the, I've just taken an intervention on the NHS and the whole issue uh, is equally covered uh, in the government's response. Uh, a very useful report, uh, presiding officer. I, I can see that the government's listening. The minister's making extensive notes. I'm sure she'll read the official report afterwards. I hope the uh, finance secretary is also reading. Call David Stewart to be followed by Richard Lyle. 
Uh, thank you, President Officer, and could I welcome uh, Ash Denham to her new position and wish her well for the future. Could I also praise the members of the Justice Committee for this first-class report on remand? In my view, it was well-researched and constructed. But I would like to focus my remarks, uh, following on really from Stuart Stevenson, on the health implications for remand prisoners. And could I draw members' attention to the Health and Sport Committee's report, Healthcare in Prisons, which was published last year. I'd also like to draw on from my own experience as a young social worker in the early 80s, working with remand prisoners across the country from Dumfries to Porterfield Prison in Inverness. Now, the Justice Committee evidence that time spent in remand is often unproductive and can lead to offending behaviour in the future. Many speakers uh, have touched on this already this afternoon and that we must look clearly at alternatives to remand. We've touched on the importance of bail supervision, uh, mentoring and electronic monitoring. But of course, as we've heard already, judges, I do believe, look carefully at the sort of dichotomy of bail versus custody. And they've got clear framework the Criminal Procedure Scotland Act of 1995. So I'm not suggesting for a second that decisions to remand are taken lightly by experienced judges uh, across Scotland. However, as the committee report concludes, there are limited services available to remand prisoners, such as education and training, which are open to convicted prisoners. Uh, I saw this from a self presiding officer just uh, a few months ago uh, on a recent visit to Porterville Prison uh, in Inverness with the Families at Side coordinator, Caroline Cooper. Now, my own assessment is that when someone is put on remand, we must ensure they get the services and treatment appropriate to them as individuals. There must be proper assessments and evidence gathered on individuals' mental health. There must be information sharing among organisations that the individuals come in contact with, local authorities, health board and other public bodies. So all this reinforces a number of observations in the Justice Committee's report. Serious concerns have been raised about those who are remanded not receiving the same level of medical service as they did outside prison, and Stuart seems in touch to that. Some of these issues included problems around medication and continuing medical services. There's also some evidence of failure to pass over medical records to those taking over care. And as Maria Cairns, who's the family visitor manager at Pullman, young offender, said, and I quote, some families have told us that they're extremely concerned about a family member in prison because the person cannot articulate their problems to the medical services. And some of the wider data sharing issues have been touched on by members, have been addressed, I think, by the Health and Justice Collaboration Improvement Board. My own particular interest is in mental health. And as Anne Pinkman of the Scottish Working Group on Women's Offending said, and I quote, too often prison is used as an alternative to a mental health facility. And I've got real anxieties that have been raised about the effectively a detox from medication for mental health condition. We all know that mood stabilizers and talking therapies are essential for things like bipolar disorders. And we know that a staggering 70% of prisoners have some form of mental health problem, and that includes remand prisoners. So the current position, uh, which was reinforced in my recent visit to Porterfield, is that a prisoner will see a qualified nurse and, and see a doctor within 24 hours. However, the committee's heard some evidence that remand prisoners have sometimes had their medication removed while waiting to be assessed by a prison-based NHS staff. This will have serious effect on prisoners. And frankly, presiding officer, I hope the minister can touch on this in her wind up. I have no idea why this happens in prison and we really have to get to a grip with this. So I fully support the Justice Committee's recommendation. What we've got is a postcode lottery for care, depending on what prison and which health board is involved. So we really need to look carefully about our information sh um, sharing, which involves IT systems and new protocols. If I can touch on to the Health and Sport Committee report, which I touched on earlier, and tie the two together, um, as we've heard in November 2011, provision for health care uh, in prisons transferred from the Scottish Prison Service to the NHS. Now, there's been a whole series of issues raised about the deployment of health care staff across the prison estate and the differences between establishments. So currently, there's no national workforce standard in place and the Health Committee recommended a minimum workforce standard in the report, which will hopefully address these issues. And just for information, which I picked up just this afternoon, 
Um, in terms of prison workforce planning, particularly for health provision, there's actually a tool in preparation, but it's going to take five years before it's effective. And one point which I don't think members have picked up that I'm aware of, um, as members will know, next month there will be a smoking ban across the prison estate, which uh, many members, including myself, will have sympathy was, uh, with. This will affect remand prisoners who smoke. However, vaping, of course, will still be allowed. On my visit to Portfield Prison, um, some concerns were raised uh, by staff about the short-term implications on pr uh, prisoner behaviour that this may well entail. Now, many public health initiatives in prison, such as alcohol interventions, bloodborne virus testing and various screening, do not always involve prisoners on remand, even though they may well have benefited from them. And as the Health Committee concluded, there is a lack of national indicators applicable uh, to prison health care. And the other key point, uh, President Officer, is that prison health care staff cannot currently electronically prescribe medication. It's all kept on manual records. This is very challenging. 75% of all prisoners are in receipt of prescription drugs. And as the Chief Inspector of Prisons has argued, many member prisoners, of course, have very poor health. So, and he said, prisons should be well placed to tackle health inequalities. So to improve health, we must also identify prisoners' long-term conditions or conditions they, are, uh, conditions they are at risk of. For example, obesity, diabetes, heart disease, and cancer. However, access to national screening for remand prisoners is needed. For example, they should be tested for bloodborne viruses like HIV and HCV, which is the hepatitis C uh, virus. But testing is currently inconsistent, it's poorly managed, and the treatment is not confidential, which clearly discourages testing and therefore treatment. It should be noted, however, that there is a short-term working group set out uh, to look at guidelines on consultation and BB v testing as we speak so in conclusion presiding officer i think this has been an excellent report which provides a policy platform for changes to both justice and health programs in the future i'm very concerned about health postcode lottery in prisons and i would ex uh, echo the conclusion of the health and sport committee which expressed disappointment about the opportunities to address health inequalities remind prisoners who are by definition untried face, face unique challenges and stigma and remand prisoners are often described as the Cinderella's of the health service. Let's have a new focus and get them central stage. Thank you, President Officer. The last of the open debate contributions is from Richard Lyle. Thank you, President Officer, and I also welcome the Minister to our post. Can I begin this afternoon by welcoming the opportunity to contribute to this debate in the process of remanding our justice system? In the early 1980s, as a district councillor, I was not, it was my privilege to be nominated as a Justice of the Peace to serve on Motherwell District Court. After appropriate training, I sat in the court twice a month. Over the years, I heard various cases regarding breach of peace, TV licensing, motoring offences, neighbour disputes, multiple of other topics, including the interesting way of signing uh, warrants. It certainly was an interesting experience. Because of that experience, I have come to the conclusion that remanding an individual should be seen as a last resort option and not as a commonly used practice. Of course, situations do exist where a person waiting for trial is a threat to society. And in, so, in, in some way, then remand should be used in that case. In, these, in cases such as that, it is right and proper that they be remanded for the sake of public safety. Unfortunately, many believe remand is being used far more often than necessary. When the use of remand is necessary in certain circumstances, the remand levels in Scotland are high. Often, remanding is counterproductive and undermines our goals of bettering our society and upholding justice, ambitions that I would hope that all across this chamber share. The Scottish Government has stated in the Programme for Government 2018-19 is committed to ensuring that remand is used only where appropriate, However, practical action needs to be taken to achieve this ob objective, and I would be very interested in the Minister's view of how this can be achieved. There's a large difference between the number of those who have been remanded and those who are ending uh, up receiving a sentence, which implies that our goal is not being met. Indeed, 
It seems that women specifically appear to be suffering more from this practice, and I also would be interested to know why this is the case. A 2012 report by the Commission on Women Offenders notes that only 30% of women remanded in custody go on to receive a custodial sentence. In other words, roughly 70% of women that were remanded were judged innocent or not given a sentence by our justice system. The average remand period for women was roughly 22 days from 2012-2013. The cost to society with this actuality is staggering. That means 22 days where women, who may have been largely innocent, were in custody away from their family, including possibly children, loved ones, friends, their employment and their day-to-day -day lives. Being absent from your normal life for over three weeks average can have long-lasting impacts that are irreversible. Disruption of family and social relationships, as well as the loss of a job or future income opportunities, can make an innocent person delve into desperation. There is a cost to the person, personally and their family. Not only is that a severe disservice to those who are remanded, but it is a severe disservice to ourselves here in Scotland. The cost of prison is high, and therefore the cost of needless remand is also high. As representatives of the people, we are charged with being good stewards of our people's money. And the cost of remand, as I say, is high. Imprisoning people for numerous weeks does not seem to be a particular effective use of our limited funds. Furthermore, the Scottish Government, I understand, also believes strongly in lowering our incarceration rates. High remand rates are not in accordance with this goal. Remand is, in essence, a shortened sentence in prison. As the Justice Secretary said in the Justice Committee meeting on April 24th of this year, it is clear to me that remand is just as disruptive as short prison sentences. It impacts on families and communities, adversely affects employment opportunities and stable housing. The very things that evidence show support the sense from offending. I would have to agree with the Justice Secretary. I've therefore briefly mentioned impacts it can have on a person, but it can be argued further that viewing remand as a short, shortened jail sentence. Remand simply does not fall into line with their commitment to move away from short-term jail sentences and replace them with community-based sentences. People who have custodial sentence of 12 months or less re-offend often, almost as twice as often as those who instead receive a community sentence. This means more crime, more victims, more prison costs. Our current use of remand only supports an outdated method of sentencing that clearly leads to more harm than good. So I would suggest it is time to change or revise this practice. Remand can affect access to benefits. The ramifications are huge and may affect every facet of an individual's life. Loss of wages, housing, etc. as already has been said. Presiding officer, as I come to concluding proportions of my remarks, I want to reiterate my main concerns with the current practice of remanding. Our society depends on a properly functioning justice system. In situations where a remand is not necessary but a remand is used, all suffer the consequences. The person being remanded wastes away in jail, waiting for a trial for a potentially long, time, uh, long period of time. This not only makes them an unproductive member of society, but also increases their chances of reoffending upon release. Our justice system should seek to turn what some people say are criminals into productive members of society, not the other way around. There's obviously a need for action on the current use of remand in our courts in order to improve our justice system, improve our country. After today's debate, I'd be interested to know what action the government can take to draw this fact to our court officials to take action to reduce remand. And I, for one, hope that we do take that action. Thank you. We now move to the closing speeches, and I call on Jenny Mara for a, a generous six minutes, please. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. It's been um, a great honour to sit through uh, this debate this afternoon. I think it's been a very enlightening debate, and I think um, it's a great privilege to be part of. It's been a few years now since... I sat on the Justice Committee, but I remember thinking when, um, when I was asked to go on the Justice Committee that it was really uh, not appropriate for me to sit on that committee um, unless I had been into some of the prisons in Scotland and seen for myself uh, the conditions of those prisons, 
um, and the, the, the kind of punishment that we send um, our prisoners to. And it was at that point, Deputy Presiding Officer, that I uh, had the um, opportunity to visit HMP Perth, uh, HMP Polmont, HMP Corton Vale and HMP Castle Huntley. And across my visits to those uh, four prisons, I really got a flavour of the kind of um, regime that um, prisoners in Scotland um, operate under. They were not easy visits to do, presiding officer, as colleagues across the chamber will know. And anyone who um, is um, uh, who labours under the thought that uh, prison is some sort of um, some sort of easy uh, option, uh, I don't think would uh, come to that conclusion having uh, visited any of our uh, prisons. I think the discussion of remand uh, this afternoon has been very, very useful. And for me, there are a couple of clear conclusions uh, from this afternoon's debate. But let's not be under any illusion. Remand is a relief. And it's a relief for victims of serious crimes and for public safety um, when it is used um, properly. And remand protects the public. That is one of the, the sheriff's considerations um, and the High Court's considerations on remand. It can be justified by accused previous convictions. And sometimes it is the only way that the court can get the accused to appear in court. Remand can be used when sheriffs just can't get the accused to appear, and often that can be because life is so chaotic. But it is my understanding, presiding officer, that sheriffs do want to use uh, alternatives to remand. And that, for me, is one of the main conclusions from this afternoon's debate, because there's been a lot of discussion from many speakers, especially from the government benches, about the alternatives to remand supervised bail and bail centres. But my big question here for the minister, and I hope she can address this in her summing up, how widely available are these alternatives? Because Daniel Johnson said in his contribution this afternoon, and he sat through all the committee evidence on this, that they'd heard that sheriffs just weren't convinced that these alternatives are available um, when the accused is leaving the dock and therefore um, go for the option of remand. I don't think bail centres are available right across the country, um, but I would really um, ask the Minister to address that point in her summing up. But I think that leads me to our second conclusion this afternoon, that this backs up the need for data on this. And this was a call very articulately put this afternoon by Liam Kerr on the Conservative benches and by my Labour colleague, Daniel Johnson. The need for data, the need for the Sheriff's reasons for making the remand decision is vital. We seem to be having this debate in the absence of all of that data, but I do understand it that Edinburgh Sheriff Court has an actual form for its own court records that asks the sheriff to list the reasons for bail. I would like to see the government after this debate and on the back of the committee's recommendations this afternoon making the pledge that they will roll this out right across the court system in Scotland so at least we have those reasons and we can come back in a year or 18, I'll take you in a minute, or 18 months time and look to the reasons and make more informed suggestions about what alternatives should be. I'll take Stuart Stevenson. Stuart Stevenson. Uh, I support the general point the member is making, but uh, given that the sheriff orally states the reasons, I think it could be done by a court official and that might uh, be more operationally efficient and stop the sheriff being delayed in doing some of the things he or she is doing. Mr. Jenny Mara. Mr. Stevenson, I'm sure that people more informed than us can work out the whys and wherefores of how that and by whom that information should be recorded. What I'm asking the government today is I think they should make the commitment to get that information recorded and get it back to the convener of the Justice Committee and bring it back to this chamber. And then we will know why remand continues to be so high. I would also say to the Minister, in all good faith, I would consider this, the Labour Party would consider this preventative spend. 
We still have um, the problem in Scotland, you know, 10 plus years on from the Christie Commission. We, uh, Daniel Johnson outlined the cost of imprisonment is £35,000 a year, I think in excess of that. And so if we think we are using remand too much and there are up alternatives that are better and would be more efficient for the public purse, then I think the Minister should see this investment as um, an appropriate use of public money. Can I just do a short canter, presiding officer, through some of the contributions uh, this afternoon? Shona Robison, I think, detailed a lot of remand alternatives, but as jo Daniel Johnson had already pointed out, as I said, those sheriffs are not convinced that those alternatives are available. I think Mary Fee and uh, Ruth Maguire spoke very eloquently on the issues of families, uh, affected by imprisonment. Can I take this opportunity? I know Ruth McGuire is quite new to, to, uh, to this, but all the years of work that my co colleague Mary Fee has done to represent families and especially children uh, affected by uh, imprisonment, um, it, it continues to uh, it humble me and impress me how committed she is to that. And I think it's so important to have that strong voice uh, here in Parliament. And I think Ruth Maguire made a very personal and touching speech, and she's right that a trauma-informed nation must break that cycle for children. Prisons are not a place for children to be going. They are not a place for children to be taken out of school and taken to during the day, and we must find alternatives to that. Like Stuart Stevenson, I have sat in Glasgow Sheriff Court. I've seen how quick it is and I agree with him. Presiding officer, I think it's been an excellent debate this afternoon, but I really hope that the Minister will address the data points in her summing up. Thank you. I call Michelle Ballantyne for around seven minutes, please. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, I'm pleased to have the opportunity clo to close for the Scottish Conservatives on this important issue. As many others have said today, the Justice Committee and their clerks are deserving of our thanks for having to put together this report. I think their work has been invaluable, and I, actually I have enjoyed the debate uh, and the report, the debate the report has created today. Um, it's actually been very insightful, and there have been some really thoughtful contributions from around the Chamber. Um, Margaret Mitchell started by elaborating on the committee's work and what was very clear is this is that this report is the product of thorough analysis and evidence collected from a broad range of sources. And I would like to start by adding um, the same call that others have made today in calling for stronger data capturing because information is the key to understanding this issue. Continued ignorance will only lead to a greater churn through the system and that is a solution that helps nobody it doesn't help the prisoners, it doesn't help society, it doesn't help sheriffs or their staff who have to deal with enlarged caseload, and it does not help our already stretched prison staff, and it certainly doesn't help the taxpayer. And Jenny Meyer is quite right in saying this is about preventative spend, and we need to allocate money appropriately. Liam Kerr spoke in detail on this issue, giving a clear explanation of why data capture is so important. And in commending the report, he highlighted conclusion 66 on page 18. And it does bear repeating again, particularly in light of what the minister said in her opening statement, because it states that information is not recorded consistently or in a way that allows for any meaningful analysis of the reason why remand is being used. It then continues by stating, to make any difference in the numbers, the reason why judges decide to remand people in custody, custody have to be better understood. Without improved knowledge and data, it is difficult to know which interventions or changes should be made to the current system. Now, the minister appeared to suggest in her opening that no further data was required, but rather better analysis of what already exists, which then directly appears to contradict the finding of the report. So I will be interested in, in when hopefully the minister sums up in her addressing this issue again, having heard the debate, because we don't want a system that is designed and taken forward on value judgments rather than on robust analysis. Daniel Johnson. I might agree with my colleague Jenny Mara that looking at the Edinburgh system and whether a simple form could be rolled out across Scotland so that data could be gathered and collated. 
Michel Ballantyne. Yeah, I mean, I haven't seen the form myself, but having sat in court quite a lot with, with my own client base when I headed the drug and alcohol unit, I think there has got to be a way to simply capture the data. And if the Edinburgh reform works, then absolutely, I would have no issues with that. Um, Daniel Johnson, Liam MacArthur, and Shona Robson and others talked about the disruption that remand causes to individual lives, particularly women, and the negative impact that... that that can have on their rehabilitation and their families. And I listened to Maurice Corrie's contribution with interest, his focus on mental health and the need for services to support individuals to be productive during the remand period. Mr Corrie was right to say that remand should not be a one-size-fits-all approach. And when Oliver Mundell highlighted that there had been a decline of purposeful activity generally in our prisons over the last few years, with nearly 300,000 hours lost in the last year alone and sitting at its lowest level since 2011, combined with a reducing number of vocational qualifications, this is really cause for concern if we're serious about rehabilitation and particularly for those people on remand. Mary Fee and Ruth, Ruth McGuire's contributions, as, as um, Jenny Mara pointed out, were extremely poignant, particularly, I have to say, um, Ruth, you, you know, the effect of, of people being in prison when they're on remand or indeed on a prison sentence on the children is horrific. Um, and I've worked with many children that have actually suffered as a result of that. And I think I would echo my colleague Liam Kerr's plea that, that the trial that is being run to provide free transport from the station to the prison is extended because Ruth McGuire was right, right to remind us that the children of an individual are not guilty and we should not be punishing them and the cost of getting to, to the prison to visit people is a punishment to the families so let's see that that being looked at please mm -hmm. Ruth McGuire thank Michelle Ballanty for her comments and for, for taking intervention I wonder if she would acknowledge and agree that the impact that this has on children and has on families is the same whether that's a short sentence or whether it's remand the damage is the same Michelle Ballanty to some degree, yes, but obviously, you know, the difference between a short sentence and a longer sentence for a child does change um, in terms of the role model disappearing completely or the relationship that they have with that person. But yes, that, that real damage and the impact is definitely there regardless of the length of sentence. David Stewart and Stuart Stevenson then raised some very important issues around health and the risks if records are not shared appropriately. And again, uh, I have seen this with young people who, who have been uh, placed on remand, um, and it does cause some serious issues. So I would welcome the Minister's comments on this as we go forward, um, and how we're going to ensure that we don't get that breakage in, in the treatment of prescribed drugs. While these issues may have been touched on, upon already, there are a couple of points I would like to address. Presiding officer, our prisons are growing increasingly dangerous. Overcrowding has only increased pressure on an already creaking system. And unnecessarily keeping prisoners on remand is only adding to that issue. In 2016-17, there were only five serious prisoner on staff assaults. Yet this number has leapt to 14 in 2017-18. In regards to minor and no injury staff assaults, these have also increased jumping from 193 to 283 in the same period. By correctly striking the balance between bail and remand, as my colleagues have noted, and by introducing greater opportunity into our prisons, we can make the service safer for all concerned. And having listened to today's debate, I would utter a note of caution, because I think we should be careful not to interfere in the independence of the judiciary when it comes to getting it right when considering whether or not to grant bail. It is not Parliament's role to tie judges' hands. Indeed, such meddling does go against the very concept of the separation of powers. Instead, it is up to judges to make individual decisions. Sheriffs have a lifetime of irreplaceable experience, and we should be making use of that, not hampering them in their work. That is why I would advise against too much debate on whether judges are getting it right. They are applying the law they are provided with, as is their duty. So in closing, I would ask the Minister to consider whether the evidence she, she has is sufficient to commit money effectively to make a difference to both accused and the victim. 
Parliament's role is to make good law and then monitor that it is working appropriately. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I call on Ashton to wind up for the government. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I'd like to thank the committee again for its interest in this matter, as well as everybody across the chamber who has contributed to today's very interesting and also helpful debate. Again, I think it's clear to see from the discussions that the matter of remand is one which is quite complex and one which spans a number of areas, not just justice. And Daniel Johnson raised this in his opening speech. And can I assure the member that the government fully grasps the complexity of this matter and we are looking seriously at this. Um, I'm not going to have time to cover all the points that have been raised across the debate this afternoon because there were so many of them, but I want to address um, a couple of key points in the time that I do have. So bail decisions are for the courts alone, and in general, bail must be granted in Scotland unless, with regard to the public interest, there's good reason for refusing. And the public interest is defined to include the interests of public safety. And public safety may indicate that a person should be remanded for the duration of the proceedings, even if there is no realistic prospect of a custodial sentence. And I'm sure members will accept that that is sometimes the case. While bail decisions are a matter for the courts, we are committed to reducing the unacceptably high rate of imprisonment in Scotland, which remains the second highest in Western Europe. And um, I do accept the committee's uh, recommendations that remand is disruptive as short prison sentences, and I believe there was consensus across the chamber on that issue this afternoon. Short-term imprisonment disrupts families and communities and adversely affects employment opportunities and stable housing the very things that the evidence shows supports desistance from offending. In recent years, the remand population has accounted for approximately 20% of the average daily prison population, and it has fallen by one-fifth since 2008. The period of time that individuals are held on remand does not help to reduce re-offending in the long term, as during that time, remand prisoners do not receive any rehabilitation programs, education or work. So reducing the use of ineffective short-term imprisonment and increasing the use of robust bail options is part of our smarter approach to tackling offending. And in the year ahead, we will extend the presumption against short sentences once additional protections in the Domestic Abuse Act are implemented. Unlike remand, bail supervision, which was mentioned by many members this afternoon, does not disrupt families and communities and does not adversely impact on employment opportunities and stable housing. The Scottish Government provides funding for each local authority to provide both bail information and supervision schemes. And while all local authorities provide community justice services that are aimed at reducing reoffending, and in part will support people at risk of demand, bail supervision and bail support services specifically are provided in at least 23 of the 32 local authorities in answer to Jenny Mara's point earlier. The funding that we are committing, which will be discussed further with COSLA before being finalised, will help to ensure bail supervision can be accessed from all areas. And many members raised this point about bail supervision and the funding for it, including um, Liam MacArthur, I think, raised this, Daniel Johnson raised this as well. And subject to the spending review and discussions with COSLA, we intend to double the capacity for bail supervision services from 2019-20. I hope that answers the member's point. Daniel Johnson. Uh, so would she acknowledge the point made by Tom Halpin uh, yesterday from, from SACRO that it's not just the level of funding, but the stability of that funding, which is the thing that un one of the key factors that undermines those services that she's talking about? Minister. I do take the member's point, but we are in a, a one-year funding cycle at the moment. That's the way the Parliament operates, but I do take, I do take the member's point on board. Um, I'm afraid, I'm, if I'm going to get through the points that have already been raised in the debate, I'm going to have to um, press on, I'm afraid. So I wanted to um, address the issues that were made about women, which were raised by a number of members, including um, Shona Robeson and Mary Fee as well. Um, the proportion of the female prison population on remand peaked at 32% in 2008-9, and while the proportion of the population on remand is similar for men and women, once the like-for-like like comparisons are made, I think particular attention does need to be given to the impact of women on remand. And the government is looking at this and has taken action specific to women on remand, including providing additional funding of £1.5 million per annum for bail support services, specifically for women on remand, and support for the Shine Mentoring Service for Women in the Justice System. 
and we will look at what more we can do in this area. I'd like to address the points on data now that um, both yourself and your colleague um, Margaret Mitchell and also Jenny Mara raised. So many people raised the, the point about the data collection and I, I have some sympathy with this argument. Um, but I do want to note that the Scottish Court and Tribunal Service commented in the written evidence that recording the reason for refusal of bail could be prejudicial to the accused at a future diet. For example, it could result in reference being made in court minutes to a schedule of previous convictions prior to a trial. And the Sheriff's Association made a similar point to that as well. And while it may be possible to extract um, data from papers when an appeal against refusal of bail is lodged, any such extraction and collation would be a manual process which would significantly impact on SCTS resources. Um, there was also the three, penalty, uh, three penal policy improvement projects which were running a couple of years ago supporting local efforts to reduce um, the use of demand. Um, these Pathfinder projects um, collected um, data themselves and they found that the reasons for remanding people um, and found that the reasons were quite consistent and, and they mostly related to um, previous convictions, the nature of the offence or simply that there was no application for bail. The Lord President has observed that noting of reasons in court um, would impose a very substantial burden on the clerk and may also then require checking, rechecking by the sheriff. So on balance, I have listened carefully to what um, has been said today in the chamber, but I'm still not yet convinced that additional uh, recording in court is the most helpful way to impact on the use of remand. There are opportunities, I mentioned these earlier, for further analysis of the existing data on remand, which I think is an opportunity that we should look to see if we can extract more information from the data that we do have to help us inform our work on remand going forward. Um, I want to address now um, support for families, um, which was raised um, in a speech by Ruth Maguire and others. Um, the SPS family strategy puts families and family contact at the heart of supporting prisoners during their time in custody and recognises the positive contribution that this can have on supporting reintegration. The family strategy doesn't differentiate between convicted or um, remand prisoners and there are also family hubs in many prisons which hold remand prisoners. And in these hubs, uh, families can access information regarding social services and also other services for their relatives in prison. And I also note that the Scottish Government provides annual funding to each of the prisoner visitor centres as well. So in conclusion, I'd like to thank everyone for taking part in this debate this afternoon for their contributions, which will inform our next steps. Our programme for government made a clear commitment on actions to help reduce the remand to make sure it's only used where it's necessary and where it's appropriate and we will continue to work with partners to support this. Thank you. Thank you very much and I call Rona Mackay to wind up on behalf of the Justice Committee and the Deputy Convener has until the top of the hour until decision time. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, Presiding Officer, I'm really pleased to be closing this excellent debate um, on such an important subject. Insurance that we've, ensuring that we find a balance between uh, society's need to be protected and the rights of someone charged with an offence is considered for remand rather than bail is a central issue in our criminal justice system. Uh, the evidence we took during our inquiry into remand was filled with personal stories, stories of women and families, of young people, of people struggling with mental health or homelessness or addiction. As the convener stated in our opening speech, during our work we had the chance to visit Circle, a national charity supporting families who face issues related to imprisonment, poverty and addiction. What we heard from them and from their partner organisations is a story of complex problems that lead to imprisonment and that can arise from a period of time on remand. Over and over we heard the words unpredictable, chaotic, addiction, children and health. Our report talks about this, the numbers being placed in remand, the problems this can cause beyond the criminal justice system, incorporating health, housing, education and more, all of which we've heard in the excellent contributions today. Speaking to Circle and their partners, we heard the voluntary and third sector organisations that support uh, remand prisoners need more predictable, secure funding, and I totally agree with that. We called for this in our report and I'm pleased to see, I was pleased to see the Cabinet Secretary recognise the value of the third sector and alternatives to remand and welcome uh, his commitment previously to provide increased financial support for these programmes. 
The issue of how we fund the voluntary and third sector is also a major focus of our pre-budget scrutiny this year. Presiding officer, I'm the co-convener, uh, along with Mary Fee of a cross-party group in Parliament focusing on women's justice. A wide and growing range of stakeholders are involved and we all have the same belief, we must stop locking women up. Six years ago, Dame Eilish Angelini's report urged a reduction in the number of women behind bars. At that time, there were more than 400 women in jail. There's a slight reduction since then, but it's still far too high. Recent figures showed that 400 women in Scotland were in prison. 75% of women in remand do not go on to be, to be given a custodial sentence. This is simply unacceptable. Women placed in remand can lose contact with their children, causing an ace for them. They may lose their tenancy, facing homelessness on release. And we've heard about all that today. So surely we must now realise that remanding women is not working and is extremely damaging. Many women need holistic support for a huge variety of issues and we must, as a humane society, be in a position to offer this. The committee also heard stories of the many people in prison who have addiction issues. In a Scottish prison service survey last year, around 40% of prisoners reported illegal drug use and around one-fifth of prisoners were being prescribed methadone. Even a short period of remand may remove people from access to the local programmes they had used to manage these addictions, unless this can be quickly provided for in prisons. And a period in prison may, introduce, may reintroduce addictions that were previously under control. These were the themes that we heard repeatedly when we visited Circle and were the themes that we've heard throughout evidence and of course they've come up in today's debate. Presiding officer, I'd, rather than go on with my speech in limited time, I'd rather highlight a few of the, the standout uh, bits from the thoughtful contributions uh, from today's debate. Uh, I agree with the convener, Margaret Mitchell's opening speech, uh, all the points that she raised. And I have to say uh, that I do agree with the convener, with Liam Kerr, uh, with um, Jenny Mara, that I, I do I take what the, the minister said and, and will think about it, but I do believe that consistent recorded data is essential for us to get to grips with why so many people are being remanded. Yes. Chill Ballantyne. On that point, and I'm glad to hear you, you, you echoing some of the thoughts, one of the things the Minister said was that data capture was, was not a good idea because it would, could be used against the person in later convictions or um, hearings. Would you agree with me that actually the data doesn't need to be identifiable because it's about capturing data that allows us to make informed decisions about remand? So if that is a concern, it is quite simple to make it unidentifiable and collect it accordingly so that it can inform decision making. I call Rona Mackay. I'd also urge members, urge members just to speak through the chair, to, not to refer to members as you, but to refer to them as members. Rona Mackay. I mean, that, that, that may be a way of doing it. I mean, I'm no expert in, in court uh, procedure, that's for sure. Um, but, you know, I, I, do, I definitely do think there's a need for consistent data. Um, so, um, Liam, Liam Kerr's contribution, he, uh, he uh, talked about the impact on families and uh, that remand has to be a last resort and not taken lightly. He also talked about the cost savings uh, that, that could be made by, by not remanding so many people. Um, Daniel Johnson's uh, contribution, I thought, was pretty outstanding, to be honest. Uh, I think uh, he said, he, he raised the question, which is so, so pertinent, is remand making si the situation better or worse? Um, he said prison can compound chaotic living. And he said that 80% uh, of women, vic of women in, are in prison are victims of trauma. I mean, I think that just speaks volumes. Uh, Liam, Liam MacArthur uh, said the number of people being locked up is shameful. Um, he ta also talks about disruption to family life and uh, mentioned, of course, that imprisonment is an adverse childhood experience, which we are now aware of, uh, and the need for community alternatives to be, to be viable and certain. And he also said that funding must be secure for the third, section, the third sector. Uh, Shona Robson uh, uh, argued for a progressive approach to justice, said the number of uh, people in remand is too high, and also talked about the impact on women and the fact that visits are significantly less than, than men. Uh, she's pleased that the revised guidance has been issued by the Scottish Government, and so am I, and also said that victims should also be supported. Uh, Maurice Corry said uh, we need to know the reasons for remand and that the lack of support in community can sometimes be a reason. 
Fulton McGregor said uh, remand prisoners are restricted before they've even been convicted, uh, that we must work together to reduce the need for remand. Uh, also talked about the access to medication being delayed and the effect on mental health, the effect on children and families. Um, Mary Fee, um, and can I, I join with Jenny Mara and just uh, congratulating Mary on her amazing uh, commitment to the impact on women and families uh, for such a long time. I think it's uh, very commendable. Um, and she, she said that further understanding must be needed as why women are at greater risk of reoffending. She said it exacerbates health issues and funding must be guaranteed and tailored, and I couldn't agree more. Um, Ruth McGuire, again, you know, fantastic contribution, speaking about families and children, about her visit to Kilmarnock Prison and the, the cost of, of the journey, the stigma for, for families uh, of, of imprisoned uh, people, and praise the organisations working with families. Um, Oliver Mundell said that people locked up are... are are not, have not been found guilty of any crime and that there was a lack of opportunity inside prison. Stuart Stevenson talked of different patterns uh, throughout prisons and uh, throughout the country, talked about his experience at Glasgow Sheriff Court uh, on a Monday when 59 cases were heard and asked how much time could then be given to considering remand um, and he suggested a study of those who go on uh, to be sentenced. Um, David Stewart's contribution was uh, amazing. He talked about the health implications um, on remand, the limited services available, um, says information, information sharing is a must, and really that it's a postcode lottery for care. And 70% of prisoners have some form of mental health issues, and this has to be addressed. And uh, he, he's, he's asked for a national screening uh, for, for prisoners on remand as well at that point. Um, Richard Lyle um, talked about uh, remand being a last resort and recalled his experience as a GP, said women are suffering disproportionately and the cost of prison is high and needless and remand is, is not effective. I don't know how much time I've got. <laughs> I think probably bring your remarks to a conclusion okay. now. <laughs> um, so, so really in conclusion, um, I, I'm... I'm not sure that we've, we've been able to give all the answers today, but I do hope the report raises the urgent issues that needs to be addressed, and I think it has been a, a very valuable debate. Can I thank again all of those who gave evidence to the, to the committee and to the hard work of the clerks supporting us, and I hope we can write a new story for those in our criminal justice system on remand. Thank you. Thank you very much. That concludes our debate. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 14182 in the name of Graham Day on behalf of the Bureau setting out a business programme. Uh, could I call on Graham Day on behalf, sorry. Yes, What's of the motion, beg pardon. Uh, does any member wish to contribute? No. Could I call, um, sorry, no member has asked to speak against the motion. The question therefore is that motion 14182 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yeah. We are agreed, thank you. The next item of business is consideration of three Parliamentary Bureau motions. Could I ask Graham Day again on behalf of the Bureau to move motions 14183 on designation of a lead committee and motions 14185 and 14187 on approval of two SSIs. Moved, President. Thank officer. you very much. And we come to decision time. I propose to ask a single question on the three Parliamentary Bureau motions. Does any member object? No one does. The question, therefore, is that motions 14183, 14185 and 14187 in the name of Graham Day on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And there is no uh, division on the committee report itself, so that concludes decision time. We'll now move on to members' business in the name of Sandra White on the 75th anniversary of Age Scotland. We'll just take a few moments for members and the Minister to change seats.